Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see such a full screen. Um, thank you for coming to this, our third virtual event for HLG. Um, got a brilliant programme lined up for you this morning. I'm really looking forward to the four events that are coming up. Um, before we get started, just um, some very quick housekeeping. Um, Philip have um, released a new affirmative statement on conduct at events, so I'm just going to read out the, um, the statement. Um, it says, um, as Senate HLG, we have a duty to provide a friendly, safe and welcoming environment for all our participants. Our ethical framework permits us to uphold, promote and defend intellectual freedom. We ask that all contributions are made with respect to the content of professional discourse and are related to the subject matter of the event. Um, and the chair or moderator have the absolute right to take appropriate corrective action in response to behaviour, comments or contributions outside this code of conduct. Um, so now that I've said all of that, um, I do want to make sure that everybody um, knows that we want to interact with the conference as much as possible today. So um, please do ask questions, put comments in the chat. We have chairs in all our sessions that will keep an eye on that and make sure the speakers um, get to the questions. Um, as ever, if you can mute yourself when you're not speaking during the presentations and um, just to avoid any um, unwanted noise. I'm saying that as the bin lorry delivers stuff behind me, so apologies for that. Um, feel free to keep your cameras on and off. It's it's entirely up to you. Um, it is nice for our speakers to see that there are people out there, but no worries if you want to keep it off, that's fine. Um, I think um, we are going to record this first session um, with Mary. Um, we won't be recording the rest of our sessions today, but um, hopefully we will be able to make the slides available through SlideShare so we'll let you know after the event. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping, so I'll go on to the main event. Um, as some of you may know, and hopefully as you can just about see from our backdrops, um, HLG turned 75 this year in 2022. Um, so I think it's quite fitting that for the first session of our first event this year, we have um, our long running Bishop the Family Lecture. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, William R. Lefanu and William Bishop were both librarians back in the day um, at, the, um, at the Royal College of Surgeons and William Bishop at the Royal College of Medicine. Um, the um, the, the reason that they are the name for the lecture is that they were um, instrumental in starting off the medical section, which was the um, the forerunner of HLG at the Library Association. Um, the first lecture was given in 1968 by um, William Fanu himself. Um, that was to celebrate 20 years of the medical section. And here we are today with the latest um, lecture in our series celebrating the 75th year. So... As I say, it's, it's, it's quite something, I think, that that's what we're starting with today. <coughs> um, the lecture has always been an opportunity to not just hear from people working um, in our own library information sector, but also to hear from people working in the related health fields. I'm very pleased to see today that our guest, Mary Cotton, um, falls into that latter category. Um, Mary is based at South West Yorkshire Partnership NHS Foundation Trust, where she's a dance movement, movement physiotherapist, psychotherapist, rather, apologies, Mary. Um, and she's here this morning to tell us a little, a little bit more about what she does. So um, without any further ado, I shall hand over to Mary, if you're there, um, yep. to, for coming to speak to us today. And I hope everyone in, enjoys the day. Hello, good morning, everyone from uh, the wonderful... Hebden Bridge, um, it's lovely to be invited to your conference. Um, and as Lindsay said, I work, uh, worked in the NHS actually for about 30 years. Actually, I was a physiotherapist before, so that's quite interesting. Um, but I work within a psychology team, primarily dealing with people who have complex traumas. Um, and I also um, specialize in acute psychosis, working on the wards, which have danced on the wards for about 15 years um, and uh, completed my PhD in 2020 with, and had fantastic help from our librarians in the trust, you know, just, they were brilliant. Every time I asked for an article or a book, you know, they were absolutely wonderful. Uh, Sarah Hennessy, fantastic. So um, as you can see, I'm in a well, I don't know if you can see, it's sort of vaulted ceiling. So I'm not, I'm not in a cave. It's a, a kind of 18th century 
weaver's house, which is really lovely to be able to to um, have that sort of historical background as a sort of creative person, sort of really enjoy living living here and living in the house. Um, so what I thought I would do today is um, the best way to experience um, what my work is as a dance movement psychotherapist is actually to move and to dance. So I'm actually going to put on some music and just see, obviously the cameras are off, so you can do or on, do whatever you like. You can, you know, sit or listen or move. Um, but I just invite you just to, to see what your body wants to do today. Um, as I said, that might be sitting, it might be standing, but if you do want to move, just move in whatever way you want um, and um, see if we can just then come back. I'll come back to the slides and explain a bit about um, how, I, how I work. So um, I'm going to just see. So this is an Italian band. Um, they actually won the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> Don't be put off. Um, and... I'll just see if I can get it on. Okay. Um, right. Put your love in here. Yeah. Can you hear that? Okay. Okay. So. Any way you feel you want to. I'm begging, begging you. Oh, not moving. Um, Lindsay, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you hear it? I'm begging, begging you. I'm going to dance anyway. You got me no. Anytime I see you, let me know. But the plan and see, just let me go. I'm on my knees when I'm begging, cause I don't wanna lose you. Hey, yeah. Da, 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 da. I'm begging, begging you. I put your love in the hand now, baby. I'm begging, begging you. I put your love in the hand now, darling. I need you to understand. Try so hard to be a man, the kind of man you want in the end. Only then can I begin to live again. An empty shell, I used to be the shadow of my life. notice in my own body is that you know we're sitting introducing myself and feeling like oh is this going to be okay whatever and then just from moving it just shifts the emotions it shifts the feelings and brings brings you into the into the brings me into the body where most where all the emotions register and and um uh get a bit stuck so sort of unsticking uh <laughs> thanks rachel um Unsticking the, those mo emotions. Was it loud enough? Could you hear it? Okay. Yep, it's okay. So I'm just going to um, share my screen. Yep. Let's see if that comes up. Yeah. 
So here we have a lovely Matisse uh, image of people dancing, coming together, uh, creating a circle. And um, what is dance movement psychotherapy? So it's not an activity. Well, it is an activity in that you're doing something, you know, but it, it's, a, it's, a psych, it's a psychotherapy in its own right. So it's a relational process in which clients and therapists engage creatively using body movement and dance to assist integration of emotional, cognitive, physical, social and spiritual aspects of self. The philosophical orientation of dance movement psychotherapy is based on the intrinsic belief in the interrelationship between psyche, soma and spirit as evidenced in the potential held and creative processes um, I really like that definition. I like the fact that they've mentioned spirit, not in a religious sense, uh, but in what energizes you, what brings you, what brings you a sense of vitality or aliveness. And the arts and you know, literature, books, poetry, writing, all do that um, as well. And I often use quite a lot of poetry in, in my work as, as well. And psyche, psyche referring to the conscious and the unconscious processes, soma with the body and spirit, as I've sort of explained there about what, what makes you feel alive. <clears throat> so the essence of the work is that the moving body is central to the development of the interpersonally constituted sense of self. So it's about relationship. And when people, when I'm working with people who have um, severe mental distress, it's the interpersonal that is often at the center, what's usually what's at the center of, of, of the problems. The dynamic nature and experience of our moving bodies is important as it allows us not only to recognize how we anticipate events, but also how we interact with others and how we are changed as a result. So if you've experienced a lot of trauma, how you interact with others will be will impact on that. You might be quite fearful of, of moving closely, uh, getting closer to someone, or you might be quite hypervigilant scanning the environment. And the work in my outpatient work, uh, as I said, is with people who have experienced complex trauma. And similarly, uh, most people on the ward will have experienced some sort of trauma. Um, so how people are interacting is really a, of a great importance um, within my work. And when you're dancing and moving, you're having a communication with that other person through your body in, in a nonverbal way. Uh, this practical immersion in the world develops from birth through interaction and relationship with others. The moving body is seen as a bounded spatial object, which is at the center of this immersion. So we are moving in utero, we're moving when we come out, when we're born. So movement is our, our mother tongue, basically. And we language our experience from movement. We learn how to, to go close, how to go far away, how close do we go to get food um, or not. <clears throat> And I think the, the one of the first prepositions is in, that a child learns about going in. So dance movement is a, as a communication. So it's using physical action to express feeling. It's a tool for communication that does not require words, which is often very difficult when someone's very traumatized. Um, often people um, will struggle to, to sort of say exactly what, what might be going on. Uh, we never stop communicating on a non-verbal level and the use of the individual's body, own body in non-verbal communication is, is what, what, what we're interested in. Um, so my PhD was uh, phenomenologically um, orientated, so it was a philosophical, um, uh, yeah, phenomenological approaches to psychopathology. Um, so I looked at the lived body, that the lived body conveys practical knowledge of how to interact with others and how to understand the expressions and actions against a background of the common situation. So I was interested in uh, people's lived body experience of severe mental distress, um, which I would refer to as psychosis spectrum, 
rather than uh, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. These are very contentious diagnoses um, and more contemporary way to view things would be as a spectrum, as a psychosis spectrum. Um, go third, back to that. Uh, so I really like uh, Maxine Sheets Johnson. She's a dance phenomenologist. She's 92 now. And I use a lot of her work. So as I said, she, she coined the, the phrase movement is our mother tongue and that our language develops out of movement. We use a lot of symbols in our, our work. So the, there's a universality of nonverbal symbols cuts across barriers, age and culture. It acts as a medium to recall, enact and re-experience. So when people are very distressed on the wards, they might be talking about snakes or God or uh, vampires or ghosts. And these are very important uh, uh, communi communications which the dance movement therapist receives and works with and the person feels understood in communicating these communicate and these communications being received so I can relax react uh, through uh, um, symbolically with with the person when they are expressing um, it might, as I said might be something to do with snakes or um, Cosmic eggs. I have heard people talking about cosmic eggs. So dance and emotional expression share, say, the same neuromuscular pathways, and therefore we can be used to select dance images. Movement metaphor. Um, so if we think what's embedded in the language, so movement in our met, um, in the metaphors, like falling apart, uh, um, going out on a limb, jumping for joy. Um, so we look for these when people are moving, what kind of a metaphor are, are they conveying? Um, holding yourself together, uh, what else? Your heart breaking. So they, they all have in, in all languages, um, this is encoded. Now I'm just going to stop talking for a little bit. Oh gosh, look at the time. Um, where am I? Stop sharing stuff, so come back to you all. Um, so wh when I'm working as a dance movement psychotherapist, um, I'll look at developmental movement patterns. Uh, I'm trained in a, what's called Kestenberg movement uh, profile. So we're going to just do a little, we're going to show you a little bit of those patterns. I'm just going to stand up again and invite you to um, maybe stand up. They're, very, they're not, they're very simple movements if you want to try them. So wh when, we're, when we're born, the first, rhythm that we have is a sucking movement because that's so they're related to physiological um uh, they have physiological aspects and psychological so sucking would be this zero to six months we're not going to do all of them <laughs> we'll just do some of them so your sucking movement if you're just kind of doing like this and if you meet someone who keeps talking and talking and talking they're kind of stuck in a in a sucking rhythm there's nothing wrong with that. There's no right or wrong. We all talk a lot too much sometimes. So you'd want to try to work with this person's trying to get their needs met in a certain, certain way. Another pattern is twisting. So you might see about age one, it's about one to one and a half. And I can't do it because I've got short hair. You might be twisting your, twisting your hair would be like a sort of twisting rhythm. And these rhythms, come about, as I said, between one to one and one and a half. If you go to a playground full of four-year-olds, ju the jumping rhythm is uppermost in their development. So you might see a lot of this jumping. Any of you have got four-year-olds or had four-year-olds. And then the five-year-olds are doing a movement like this, which is get out of the way, pushing people, uh, not in a bad way, but it's like they're so busy trying to sort of um, just make their way. They're using what's called a, it's called a spurting ramming rhythm. So we're just going to dance a little bit again. Um, just come back to the music. I need to keep an eye on the time, don't I? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Am I okay, Lindsay, for time? Um, it's 25 past, but we started a little bit late, so. That's okay. So I'll just play one bit more, month, a little bit more music, and then I'll... It just goes by so quickly. Uh, right, so. Okay. So I'm just going to play it's um, 
a band from Mali. And because I often play use music from around the world, because on the ward, a lot of people are coming from different cultures. <laughs> Okay, so just inviting you to stand up again and try a twisting, a sort of jumping movement to this. Okay, so twisting. Sucking. Twisting. stop the music <laughs> okay um and we're just about running out of time so i'm probably going to have to skip through the slides and just send them to people but um here's some of the images that people have spoken about in the wards part of my research and oh, just yeah yeah so i think just to come finish on this one um and yeah okay so alan shore's work a new, uh, neuroscientist says that implicit memories are more likely to become available through mythopoetic images the language of dreams metaphor poetry and story than they are as personal recollections and explicit memory so often um, engaging the person or inviting the person to, to share an image or a dream, as I said, when people are very distressed, they often talk in mythopoetic images anyway. So the trauma survivor often, ha often have a deep understanding of a sacred world that sustains them, even in the most depriving and abusive of environments. And that can be through the language of dance or, or through literature, poetry, or through the arts, which is sort of engaging with, with the with the right brain rather than the left. Okay, I think I've probably got to finish there, which is a shame, but uh, I know you're on a sort of time limit, so I probably have a little bit of time for some questions. You've got a couple more minutes, Mary, so. Okay, well, perhaps I could just share with you what my research questions were. Um, down, back to down here, yeah. Okay, so as I said before, um, this, is, this is from the British Psychological Society that people's experience of psychosis is often poorly understood and there is vigorous debate about whether it's even meaningful to think of these as symptoms of mental illness. Um, there's often common experiences that, can often be a reaction to trauma, abuse, or deprivation. Thus, calling them symptoms has advantages and disadvantages. So as I said, I was interested in people's lived experience, um, the lived body experience, um, and responding to that within this emerging field of philosophically led research into embodiment. Research questions were, what do the qualitative dynamics of movement during the DMP process, reveal about the mechanisms at play in DMP in acute adult mental health, and what do the metaphoric and symbolic processes also reveal? So I worked, I researched on the wards with the mixed methods um, uh, methodology, and um, I looked at converging the data from the movement analysis and the metaphoric and symbolic communications. Uh, so when people are experiencing 
mental distress, severe mental distress, is often altered sense of time and space. So I look specifically at how people were, were experiencing space and time. Um, and the results showed that, yes, we knew they were altered, but they were altered in a very specific way. And the men were uh, uh, had a men's group and a women's group, and the men were experiencing space and time in a very different way to the women. So I think I'm going to have to talk about that another time. <laughs> Just got to the exciting bit, but realize. Um, I mean, one result that came out from, from the study was that the importance of group for men, of sociality, which uh, I thought might have been the case with the women, but the women were much more dyadic. And um, I've used that result from the study to pilot a men's uh, movement group. Because as we know, the suicide rates in men are the highest, um, and they're the highest in Yorkshire and Humber, where I work. So um, I've, I've been very interested in, in uh, looking at how we can offer interventions that might be more, uh, that men might access. Um, so for my study, it was the group and it was around the activity actually. So thinking as, as librarians, we offering, you know, uh, around the book club or a book, you know, something that we'd offer specifically. I'm not saying women don't, but in my study, it was, Quite interesting and it's been backed up by the Movember Foundation did a big study. Um, so that's where I've got to in a sort of post-doctorate way which is really great something I can work on. So I think I'll just finish there probably that's a good place to finish. Thank you so much Rita, it's, it's, it's been really interesting, I think you've really whet everybody's appetite and mm -hmm. would love to know more about it. I'm sorry we don't have more time today. Yes. Um, I just have one very quick question that's coming in the chat. Um, we, we don't have very much more time, but perhaps we could just ask this one. Um, Rianne's okay. asked whether there's many um, dance movement psychotherapists in the UK and would sessions be of benefit to clinical colleagues who've experienced tra trauma during the pandemic? Um, working with the NHS, there aren't that many. Um, I mean, my background was in, in mental health physiotherapy, so that helped. I'd already had a, um, was already working in the NHS. Um, so I think there's probably on the register, there's a, a few hundred anyway, I don't know the exact figures. Working in the NHS, not, not so many, I can't come up with figures, but and definitely, yes, a group for, um, uh, yeah, clinicians who have worked through the pandemic. Absolutely, I have a colleague who does some movement work in the wellbeing service over at Oldham. So, um, yes, absolutely. I'd be quite interested in that. <laughs> Could be online. Um, thank you so much, Mary. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't think we've got time for any more questions. But if people do have more questions to pop in the chat, we can pass them on to Mary. Yes, I'll certainly be able to you know, answer them. Uh, yes, unfortunately, I've got, yes, I have to have got a clinic later this morning, so I need to drive over to Wakefield. But uh, yeah, but it's been fantastic. And yeah, it just feels like, you know, you get going. There's su it's such a huge area, um, but it's, it's certainly, um, you know, it's developing and it's people becoming much more aware of the impact of trauma on the body and how it, manifest so um but yes thank you to health librarians <laughs> uh really really helped helped me a lot and uh i value your work you know greatly that, thank that's you. lovely to hear and, and thank you for your time and um i think maybe we should start all our conferences with a little dance at the start i think it's yeah. <laughs> yes i am i'm kind of supporting them with it yes thank um, you Thank you, Mary. Yeah, uh, thanks lots. Thank. Have a good, have a good conference. Thank you, everyone.